you're ready for another dose of Sono stuff. Sorry, it's been a while since I released anything. I've been working hard trying to get ready for an upcoming trip to Uganda. I'm going with Global Emergency Care Collaborative, an amazing organization tr- changing emergency care in East Africa. If you haven't heard about them, check them out. I'm sure I'll have a couple interesting cases to discuss next month. Now, recently, a resident posed a question to me, what can I do besides thinking about my H&Ts during a code? This is a scenario we all face in emergency medicine. A patient comes in coding, they may be in PEA arrest, and you think about your H's and T's. But besides hypovolemia, maybe giving blood or hyperkalemia and giving treatment for high potassium, the other reversible causes are going to be made known by ultrasound. And we all know now how important it is to have high quality CPR and to really limit interruptions in CPR. So I'm going to show you some tips and some clips of ultrasounding during CPR that can really knock off some of these H's and T's. Caution here if you get motion sickness. The easiest place to start are the lungs. You want to roll out tension pneumothorax or maybe just a pneumothorax causing hypoxia. You can do bilateral ultrasounds either with a linear or phased array probe and just look for sliding and comet tails. You want to do this at the most dependent portion for air to collect, so that's going to be at the highest parts of the chest. But you have to go in the available regions because CPR is going on at this time. So just do your best, and you just have to give a couple bag valve mask breaths or a couple breaths through your endotracheal tube to document that sliding. The next pretty easy thing to do while you're on the right side of the patient is look at Morrison's pouch. You can typically do this even under CPR, and you can rule out a large amount of blood in the abdomen. You could also easily look at the pelvis to rule out free fluid. It's unlikely that I would complete a full fast exam during CPR. The next thing to move on to is the heart. You want to rule out a large pericardial fusion. You should also be thinking about a large RV and right atrium in the setting of a large pulmonary embolism. But in a heart that's not contracting, this can be very difficult to diagnose. And the RV is going to look larger than normal anyway. You want to get good at your apical four chamber view because this is the perfect view to use during a resuscitation and CPR. It is not where the hands are compressing on the chest. It's not going to create a bunch of jelly in that area where you're having compressions. You can get a really good sense of whether there's an effusion or whether there's a drastic abnormality between the ventricles. Furthermore, if you have a great apical four chamber view, you can keep the probe on there the entire time during the CPR. And that way, when you pause for a rhythm and a pulse check, you can already visualize the heart. And then you can tell right away whether there's going to be a pulse or not, because you can see whether the heart's contracting. Also, you can diagnose arrhythmias. They may not be able to see on the rhythm strip or on your defibrillator. That means you could have a shockable rhythm and not know it. So look at it with the ultrasound. You might catch V-fib when the rhythm strip or the defibrillator is showing PEA or asystole.